evening. Hello. Hi. That was a pretty good response. Um, welcome. Great lecture tonight. I'm really excited to learn more about things that I definitely can't pronounce. Um, but it is really, really interesting stuff. My name's Adam Jefford. I'm the manager of the Asia Pacific Design Library. Um, I get the great job of doing some housekeeping, and of course, it is my great pleasure as well to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and to pay my respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Kurilpa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people, and we proudly continue that tradition here today. Housekeeping, toilets are on either level. In the event of an emergency, just go to your nearest door. We will assemble outside the Gallery of Modern Art. Um, as always, we are live streaming and filming tonight's event. Um, for any of your colleagues who couldn't make it tonight, um, they can definitely tune in now through our Facebook stream, uh, Asia Pacific Design Library, also through the UQ Architecture live stream as well, and it will be up on Vimeo in about a week's time. I should thank the audience again. There has been some fantastic articles being written about the lectures week on week, um, you know, and last week was no exception to that. I think we have about 15 articles that came through, so we're just working through them. Please keep sending them in. We love to publish them. We love to share them. And of course, you guys that are architects, you get um, professional points as well. So if you did want to talk about that, please catch me after the lecture or send us an email. We'd love to do it. Um, following along tonight on your phones, which I know are on silent, but of course you can be hashtagging any of your thoughts all the way along the hashtag, I think. Great is in the right hand, bottom corner, Twitter, Instagram, um, and all of the others. So it's my pleasure as always to welcome Kelly to the stage to introduce tonight's speakers. Please make a welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Hi everybody and welcome. It's great to see you all here again. It's especially great to see so many students in the audience. I know that you're keen to hear about these guys and what they're about because they're around our school quite a lot. Um, before I introduce Fred and Mugay, I want to briefly mention the school's social outreach studio. And I know I talked about this in the formal terms last week, but I wanted to just give you my take on it because the Social Outreach Studio was an idea of mine that I came up with in conjunction with Sandra Kaji O'Grady when we had to develop a sort of philanthropic thrust for the school. And the reason we thought of the Social Outreach Studio is because we like to take students away. We like to take them on field trips. We like to give them experiences with the public, with communities. And we have a lot of We've had a lot of success with government funding in doing that, but they're for very specific students and very specific locations often. So we can't do that as much as we'd like. And we know that some students still can't afford to participate in that in some other opportunities that we've ha we have. So we developed the Social Outreach Studio, which is an entirely philanthropically funded studio. We're hoping to run one later this year. And it will mean that all students will get to go and travel into a community, do a project that means something to a community, that a community, uh, in a community that doesn't normally get much access to architects. So perhaps in regional Queensland, and if we get a, enough money, perhaps in the Pacific. So there's a lot of great opportunities out there and we'd really love you to support it. So if you, by any chance, sitting in the audience or watching at home would love to support this, you can Google uh, the UQ Social Outreach Studio and make a donation. Maybe you'd like to say thanks to us for putting on the lecture series and giving us a little bit of money in that way. So if you'd like to do that, that would be fantastic. Now on to tonight's lecture. We've got Federico Fialo Teixeira and Muge Belek of F-flat architecture. Fred and Muge to their friends here in Brisbane as they are now. Muge is a researcher and part-time lecturer at QUT and a design studio leader at UQ. She's got a BSc in architecture on collaborative design studio environments from Istanbul Technical University and an MArch from the AA um, Design Research Laboratory. She's worked in several architectural firms including Zaha Hadid Architects in London, Istanbul and Brazil. 
She's got a PhD, so she's very highly qualified to talk about this stuff on trans architectural acoustics, and I don't even know what that is, I've got to admit, but I'm super looking forward to hearing more about it tonight. Um, where she worked for two years with Marcus Novak in University of California, Santa Barbara, Trans Lab. So I think we can see some resonances with the um, name of the, um, of the lecture tonight, which is Trans Architecture. Fred, on the other hand, is an architect, a media artist, and he lectures with us at UQ. He initially graduated in architecture and urbanism and holds a postgrad degree in the history of architecture from um, Porto in um, Portugal. Um, he's deve developed his architecture towards an MArch from the AA, um, and again at the Architecture Design Research Lab, and he collaborates with Muge in their practice uh, F-flat architecture. And I've already been asked a question about this. Why is it called F-flat? So maybe that's something we can send towards Chris later on, who's going to be the discussant. Um, so I, I'd like you all to welcome Fred and Muge to the stage as we hear about their work together in trans architecture. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah? So, okay. hello. Hi, everyone. So, uh, it's going to be exciting because it's the first time actually we are doing this together. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> generally, people ask one or the other. Maybe it's going to be an overload, but I hope it will be okay. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> so, let's run the show. Yeah. So, um, we are going to go through trans architecture. And mainly, is we are going through the kind of a mode of operation or how we work and how it became such a, a focus in our practice, in a way. So uh, one way of looking at things is um, about how do you look at the world, how you perceive the world, and it's an, in a generalistic approach, and that's intentionally what we do, um, looking at uh, Ferdinand Porsche in 1900s. He developed his first car. It was an electric car. Everybody laughed at him. Um, imagine how many problems he would have solved if things were propelled that way. Um, obviously, it didn't continue that way. Within more our field would be uh, Frederick Kistler. Uh, he also developed the vision machine without any kind of knowledge on what could be an electronic device or interactive device. However, the will to interact with space kind of propelled his, his, his designs. Um, yeah, and uh, basically what we are going to talk about is very much the operation that he was going through. And uh, many of our works actually correlate on to biology and uh, basically develops from his studies and his research. So um, before we move on to our works, we would like to give a briefly uh, explanation about uh, our understanding, which is the on transdisciplinary. Um, so we'll be talking about um, this uh, concept, what it means. So it was uh, uh, firstly put forward as a, as a keyword uh, by Piaget, uh, who was talking about um, this new kind of uh, knowledge um, called this one, this one. Uh, on transdisciplinary. So um, one of the um, protocols of the OECD countries for the upcoming years is based on this kind of an understanding of uh, disciplinary research. And um, what it talks about uh, is quite different than interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary understanding of uh, research. So here is a diagram of what each of those mean. Um, if we have several disciplines, um, the interdisciplinary research works within two disciplines and the multidisciplinary is like a combination of all the different disciplinary people working all together. Um, this is a diagram by Cosimi, he talks about these ideas. Um, whereas, um, According to the trend idea of transdisciplinarity, um, these disciplines, um, by working together after a while, uh, passing to a certain time, uh, they start to collapse. So this is a mathematical um, 
kind of a diagram which, uh, which is called the pair of pants uh, paradigm. So they uh, tend to um, evolve within time and become a new discipline. And when that happens, they are not trans anymore and they become another discipline, and it's kind of an evolutionary process. So there are examples of so such. So from biology to computational biology, where biologists need to become computational engineers. So now it's a field. Uh, in the 70s, it was multi multidisciplinary kind of uh, situation. So things try, tend to merge. <laughs> and collapse. So it's, um, it's an evolution, uh, and a new field emerges, and then the system just starts all over again. So it's an ongoing type of an understanding of uh, looking at disciplines and the field of uh, knowledge. Um, so um, today we are talking, of, uh, talking about this merge more often because uh, we are all using similar uh, technologies, and these technologies allow us to unify different ways of uh, approaching the, the, the field of knowledge. So there's kind of a unity across all the disciplines. Um, and um, according to Kuhn, uh, he talks about the scientific revolutions. Um, he, he says that uh, scientific achievements uh, for a time provide a model of understanding. And then uh, when there is more knowledge accumulated in that kind of field, and those theories might not uh, explain what's happening anymore, and uh, you would need uh, another way of looking at things. So uh, new uh, theories emerge, new achievements happen, so there are these thresholds within the evolution of knowledge and uh, within the evolution of disciplines as well. Um, yeah. So having said that, um, there is a kind of a really a great difference between these two understandings of looking at disciplines and the way we perceive the world. So um, these are, um, we can just talk about it in this way of a chart where uh, disciplinary knowledge is more based on um, ex um, in vitro conditions, whereas transdisciplinary knowledge is, made, uh, is based on uh, in experience and how we experience uh, the world. So it's part of um, um, our research where we try to find out new things and we try to um, create an understanding uh, of the phenomena rather than um, claiming knowledge, like saying I know this or I know that. And um, we are trying to experience, experience the world through a um, kind of an experience-based uh, understanding where, the, uh, where it's not an external part of our lives, but we tend to make a, uh, use that uh, knowledge and try to see the outcomes of it. So it's, it's a kind of uh, looking at the world uh, through uh, astonishment and uh, sharing. So we really uh, appreciate and value the idea of sharing knowledge and, um, and, and learning from others and learning from our experiences as well. Um, so if you look, off, uh, look at the, um, the world of knowledge, um, this is kind of a diagram where we can really understand what it means uh, to be a transdisciplinary uh, person or transdisciplinary researcher, where um, if this is the field of knowledge and we are looking at it with a magnifying glass, um, the disciplinary research has its really defined boundaries and um, it will be zooming in its own kind of an area, uh, whereas uh, the interdisciplinary researchers would um, communicate, but always looking at their own magnifying glass. And um, transdisciplinary researcher would say, okay, I don't have any boundaries in relation uh, to my, I have boundaries, but they are not as strict, so I'm flexible about knowing other disciplines and other discipline knowledge and what's happening within those disciplines. So the boundaries become more um, flexible and more permeable in a way that uh, we can start to learn different things from each of the uh, disciplines. So, um, yeah, like, like we mentioned Kuhn as an important um, reference point, um, we, um, those moments of transvergence happens when there is no um, 
not enough explanation from the existing theories and it's kind of um, an unknown trajectory so that um, so that we'll be just uh, exploring and we have this really interesting transvergent sound, transvergent sound happening <laughs> along <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um, yeah, so when the, the existing disciplinary knowledge cannot explain some of the phenomena, uh, then they start to you know, s uh, expand those boundaries and try to find new ways of uh, looking at things and uh, new ways of uh, understanding uh, the, the space. So, um, well, um, Marcus Novak, um, while we spent that time, you know, two years in the trans lab, we had a lot of chance to work with him, and and he defines transverges as a um, and a flight like a, um, to the to an alien archipelago, and um, he talks about uh, leaps, uh, and he he suggests that these can only be achieved through uh, tactics of derailment. So, uh, what this means is that. Um, if we, and um, this is another diagram, which is a light cone diagram, is a scientific uh, type of uh, um, understanding of where we are uh, in time. Um, so we have an accumulation of knowledge uh, in relation to our history. Um, and uh, there are general trends that um, all, most of the people follow up. Um, in order to be able to um, move to elsewhere where we, we need to be exploring new things, there has to be something that derails us from that general uh, path of the trends. And um, that's the claim where, um, as designers, we think that transdisciplinarity can um, achieve that derailment and it's called uh, transvergence. So, um, yeah, so you move from the the common ways of knowing and try to find new new paths along the way for yourself, for your understanding. And this can happen in many different um, scales um, and many different mediums, um, which uh, Deleuze and Guattari um, calls them um, the um, plateaus, so that you can just be able to jump from one one way of thinking to another um, and explore new ideas and new understandings of looking to, a, um, to that. One way moment. of looking at the diagram would be like now we are in the digital era and uh, in 1994 or nine, we are not allowed to use the computing architecture, it was forbidden. Now it's kind of compulsive. Yeah. So you already see the transvergence there. So that's the practicality of it. Uh, or maybe um, there was a moment in time when we were talking about the rules of physics and then they were not uh, enough to explain the phenomena in relation to quantum physics. Then we have the quantum theory and then maybe it's not enough to explain the nanoparticles so we have the nanotechnology. And it's always like this um, evolutionary and uh, ongoing type of uh, research. Um, so tonight we'll be talking about what it means for us and how we see it uh, through our works. And um, this sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. <laughs> it's yeah, quite tricky. Um, yeah, so we'll be uh, looking at um, through um, the tools that we use, like parametrics, uh, algorithms, uh, and interactive tools, and what they mean for us. Um, yeah, so. I mean, this is one way of understanding the world that everybody's already used to it and focused on. And um, so everybody learned about parametric design or algorithms, even if you don't use it, or interaction design. And those things for us are one part of what forms the whole architecture, and uh, we cannot separate them. And below there's some sort of uh, indication of what this parametric system might mean. Uh, for us, it's about producing something. Uh, on algorithms is maintaining that production, so keeping some sort of uh, um, live statement or reaction statement to it. And the interaction is when something from outside interacts with the space, which is all of them are part actually of architecture. We are always interacting with space. We are always producing and maintaining the self and, and uh, making or producing architecture as well part of, of our jobs. So, and, and this is one way of addressing that. However, we see it from another perspective, which will go 
through further ahead. Um, so on parametricism, we'll go and now starting on our works. Um, so we started on 2003, and that's the first time we, we bumped into parametric design. And uh, this was a competition that we got um, a mention of. It was for the Athens uh, Olympics. And uh, it was a, a, a monument where there would be some things projected and, uh, and it would be act as a Dorinthium column, which was deformed, intentionally deformed, but with a lot of media displays in it. It was like on ephemeral structures. Yes. That was the, like the theme of that uh, competition. Correct. Um, so this is one way of addressing. We always use animations and, and fields or and dynamic factors in order to, to propel our design because it's about behavior design. How can you appropriate space? So you pick up on the Durante call. You try to analyze how people are going to pass through and how information will come out, and that's what these three images go through. But the most important thing about this would be there's the you know day views and night views, but the most important thing would be the next the next phase that uh, that will go, and it's about the construction of it. So the reason that we actually got entangled was at the time there's no paneling tools or Revit or anything like that. You need to do everything through Excel. No so, grasshopper. Yeah, nothing. so basically <laughs> you connected Maya, which is our tool. Uh, at to, the time. At the time. <laughs> uh, to uh, Excel and try to actually get all these panels fabricated and explain everybody how does this work because nobody would actually understand and just say oh, this is going to be too expensive, it's not going to be built. But it, is, it was going to be built and that's how we propelled and that's how we actually used these systems in Zaha did in order to propel what she did back in 2000. Yeah. Um, more on parametric design and, and moving fast forward, and, and this is not a chronological order, but no. the other time of, of understanding is about acoustics. We always worked somehow with acoustics. I don't really know why. It's sound, but uh, we always yeah, felt yeah, touched um, and everything it's, is... It's a personal kind of... A yeah, and, but sound is always present everywhere anyway. There's all about vibrations in, in the excitement of the mirror. And this was in 2012 uh, in the <coughs> smart geometries. And uh, we were at the Risella Polytechnical Institute and we so tried... So maybe we should talk about a bit smart geometries. They might not know. So it's a, it's a kind of a workshop that happens every year in, in some place in the world where it brings in... Uh, researchers that would like to experiment more on digital technologies and tools. So it was part of that. Um, yeah. So uh, um, basically what we wanted to achieve was a, a reactive canopy that would react to sound. And uh, that's, these are the behaviors where you, you either converge sound or diverge sound in order to, to certain different situations. Uh, obviously we had a kind of an, an ideal situation because we were at inside of a semi acoustic room which ha was all rigged and allows you a lot of flexibility. So you don't need it to build the rigging elements, mm -hmm. but so these rigging elements that you see here um, are already established. So it's an ideal situation to build something in our own way, uh, which rarely happens because things tend to be uh, more static. So uh, basically, which was designed with four fingers uh, and on each side, which actually create and, and try to, to convey to sound. However, on top of sound, we actually wanted to be reactive to people and behavior, how we would move in. We even went further, one step further, but it didn't work out, you'll, you'll see why. Um, so this is basically, this is all rigged, it's already established at the Risella Polytechnical Institute, and it would be controlled by an op uh, open sound control system, uh, which actually is an interaction uh, tool. We did the normal acoustical, uh, architectural acoustical analysis. So we went into Rhino, but it was developed in Rhino, which the plugin was also at its first stage. It's it's uh, called Pachyderm, and uh, so it was funny to because usually we used a specific software called Odeon, mm -hmm. but in this case everything was so experimental and, and it allowed us to get this kind of output. Um, so basically, what we wanted, we used this system. We wanted to be reactive, and basically, that's what we used: Pachyder, MATLAB, and Firefly and Service, so Arduinos, and and this would connect to the Winch system, which by itself is going to be controlled by 
or a CMX MSP, it's another tool that we use for production of sound and open sound control, so interaction design. We like added a visual um, programming yeah. language similar to Grasshopper. So, and also it can connect everywhere yeah. because it's open sound control, so it, it's, it's open to all kinds of sources. One thing we wanted to do as well would be mind control. That didn't work out so fast because it needed to be so calm in order to your brain waves to be scanned properly. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're feeling excited, it doesn't sketch and the whole thing starts moving erratically, and so yeah. it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but probably now it might be better because the sensors are better. Yeah. We are following that path as well. Um, and this is basically a video of what we did and how it was assembled. So the whole rigging you see, so we are in, obviously in the ideal situation. It's a semi echoic room. This is where there are performances, they record performances here. And there's all these rigs that can be controlled by OSC, open sound control, because uh, it always allows uh, dynamic systems or, or uh, react interactive systems always have some sort of OSC open channel, open to it. So we needed to, to CNC and fabricate everything of this, and that's where parametric control came in, because mm -hmm. we didn't know how, how this would be uh, kind of folding, and so all that needed to be controlled and, and kind of simulated in Rhino um, beforehand. So after that, this, the whole project took 12 days, yeah. and uh, I, we, I was just, we were just part of it. We were not, it's not our project. Um, but we contributed for, for all this happens. Um, and the problem here is that the rigging, once you move things, because you have such a big beam, it starts to balance. Mm -hmm. So you also need to control the open systems and the interaction. Otherwise, things start to become very, very uh, unbalanced and doesn't create the fog. You see that move sideways just by moving the fingers. So a lot of coding going down there, and uh, and you see him now. You will see for the head, people interacting and interacting with when you move your arms up, one hand falls up and moving forward and, and backwards, it would start reacting both to sound and behavior if you wanted. Obviously, it was an extra. We obviously it was only focused on a sound, but uh, we got enthusiastic about the interaction. And, try to exploit our fields. And that's part of the trans element. You, you see potentials everywhere that are not directly linked to it, to the, to, to the design, but there are potentials and parallel elements that can actually be part of it and so enhance you, it. So you tend to derail uh, along the way of the design process where you, you start to explore new things and you, you wonder more about it. So it's not, it's more, sometimes they fail and some, and most probably you won't see those that are failing here in this presentation. Yeah, there's a lot of failures. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we, we were part of those. And uh, even the fabrication, we had other elements for diffusers and things like that that were going to be activated with Arduinos, but they didn't work. Oh. In any case, on parametricism, uh, this is how we generally design. Uh, we are a designer. We just design a system and and there's some sort of input and output, but it's not directly connected. Um, so there is kind of a passive mode of behavior to the whole parametric design. And that's what one thing that triggers to, to have the, I saw it, the use of algorithms, okay. Um, so the feedback. So okay. that's one thing that makes everything automated and creates a response that are unexpected, but they are more natural to the algorithm. So to the design than you. So you are not in control of the design itself. You are in control of the behavior of the design. And that's, that's one thing that gets you going and get very, very interesting outputs that will never cross your mind. So uh, this project um, is called the Biophotonic Avatar, which we, we designed in 2006. Um, it was, again, another competition entry. Um, no. 
and um, we we started um, analyzing some of the understandings of uh, how the the plants work uh, by means of tropism, so how they respond to an environment and and how they um, act. Um, so if you see the time lapse video on, of this plant, you you see how it moves and how it reacts to uh, within a time change. Um, uh, one one extra element that's interesting for us here is that you don't have any rigging in a plant; it's embedded yeah. on the behavior. You don't have any muscles either, so we don't actually need muscles to make things move. It's called it's some sort of a tropism, and yeah. that's what mimosa has, and it reacts to certain. To many conditions elements of conditions of, of environment. environment and it's consequential so basically once you touch this element that leaf informs the other that needs to be collected it's not a general behavior so that gives you a lot of potentiality basically on, on the unit not the control of the whole plant itself but one unit gets controlled and the whole behavior gets appropriated by the plant this. Is it your maybe? Yeah, no. Maybe. So yeah, and, and this is what happens when, once you are um, once you are looking at at that kind of tropisms uh, through a microscope. And this is basically what plants do: is they create more fluid or less fluid in order to create tension, uh, in order to you know be open or closed and fall down. So there's obviously less fluid, and things work on that manner. And that's what basically reacts to that. And what we wanted is the, the, the plant also reacts to sound. So if you put heavy metal, it tends to close. If you put, uh, if you put Tchaikovsky, uh, it opens, it blossoms again. So, uh, and it's not because it likes one more than the other, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's basically vibrations. because of sound. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and sound, if you analyze sound, it's, it's basically, this is how a particle of sound evolves, uh, yeah. an attack. Uh, so the propulsion of and the decay of it, there's a sustain and the release. So that's when the sound falls off. And it's all particle related. And this is what we try to do. We wanted to have one leaf that would react to that kind of sound and situations. So it could be, it's a parametric design in a way. However, you are not parametrizing the geometry, you are parametrizing the behavior. And uh, this is the matrix of behaviors, that's what it is. The unit is here, so sectional behaviors, the spinal behaviors, and you have a matrix of these, which would allow us to get the flexibility and, and whatever that element could be appropriated in space and how it would react to, to sound and, and the environment itself. So with that, only with that kind of matrix, these things can occur, and, uh, and you, don't need, you don't need to control all of them, you need to control one and it forms all the other ones, all the others. And, uh, and this is what basically what goes through. There's, there's a bit of coding here, but the, mo the most important thing is the, the noise deformer, the parameterization of the frequency, so it reacts to friction, seed pitch, and, and all the ADSR, so the attack and, and release of, of the sound. So all of these are actually reacting to that kind of an element. And this is how it could actually be propelled in put in the environment and would adapt to different situations and uh, also urban situations. And we would go and uh, have also, because it's algorithm and it's live, we always tend to do animations in order to be self-explanatory. And uh, this is how basically what it works. Here we use microsounds. Microsounds are particles of sound that are not longer than one microsecond. Uh, and we compose those in order to trigger this. So uh, once you use microsounds, you know you are controlling particles of sound. So it's easier to actually put anything in the environment and you know that you are controlling that frequency, that pitch of that particle of sound, not so much any sound. And it might react to any sound. We never had the chance to it. But uh, so this is kind of how the algorithm runs. And you don't really like know the exact outcome of the al algorithm. You have an understanding of it. Uh, you are in control of it as a designer, um, but because it, it has a, um, as its own type of logic embedded into it, it uh, uh, it will react in ways that uh, that it learns out of that experience. So um, 
with this one, like this is a sound that it is uh, kind of reacting to, and so it we, behaves. So we don't animate the whole thing. We animate one element, and that element informs the other, just like the mimosa, uh, and starts to create and adapt to this kind of environment. And this is not an environmental condition, so it's not outside in the world, which is, there's so much more information. And this is only reacting to sound. As you see, the, there's no light, there's nothing. And it starts to do all these kind of weird things that we didn't expect, but uh, became part of the animal. And this project was like much before than the manta ray project, so um, it had we had kind of a vision of how it might reflect upon a um, kind of a built structure, and we have like uh, talked about it on a conference um, for acoustical engineers, and they were really like amazed with the um, with the potentials of what reactive acoustics might trigger um, when you embed sensors into a structure and if they start to get this information from its surrounding and uh, act accordingly. And this is where we might answer the question a bit, at least. Or more question marks to Kelly. This is what we understand of transacoustics. Acoustics generally is the control of sound. Mm -hmm. However, we actually think there could be an interaction of sound and, and another way of experiencing it. So that's that's what's happening, yeah. So, um, yeah, and uh, on algorithms again, uh, we started to figure out, and this, at this time we, we went to California, and we were at, with Marcus at TransLab at uh, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, at the California Nanosystems Institute. So we are within a biological nanosystem institute where you see all these guys dressed up with white, like X-Files. and. Uh, and you, are, you question, what are they doing and why are we doing here? The reason why they put people there is to, to immerse art and science and has a, a very specific practical purpose with creating visualizations and interactions. However, there's so many other things that can transpire from that and, and basically that's how the whole architectural, uh, uh, artistic media arts uh, realm evolves within, within those uh, parameters. And, you have the same thing at CERN. You have invited artists, and things can be propelled and be experienced in a different way. And so, in a way, transverged. So this is the relations. And uh, one, one question is, when architects use uh, genetic algorithms, my question is, would be, our question is, like, why do they always look the same? Uh, I mean, we have a genetic algorithms. Look at us. You know, this is our world. Uh, and, and if you look, they're all different, and you experience it different, and they look different. So if they're all billings, we belong here, and the animals, obviously, between the slime molds and the fungi. Yeah. That might sell something, but uh, anyway, so if you want to do this or this in architecture, how do you design the algorithm? That, that would be a question that is not really explanatory on all the algorithmic designs that you see in architecture. And uh, one way of addressing it would be how this process of genetic algorithms and generally morphogenesis uh, react. And this is how do they react. And this is uh, an, m a view of, uh, of a microscope in order nanoparticles in water, how do they interact with each other? And that's basically how cells are also developed. And uh, this is called Brownian motion. And every cell can be traced and has its own behavior. The way they move and react and displace, translate themselves through space is about chemical reactions and signaling. So they send a signal through chemicals in order to react and they displace themselves. There is no randomness into this behavior, but the way they get together then, that's another realm. So all this occurs within a cell and starts, the multicellular element starts to, to evolve and there's a cell migration and through kind of, um, uh, different ratios and proportions in, in chemical reactions, you start to have this kind of different type of elements of, of uh, cells that will actually create the body. In this case, of, is a, a dragonfly. And uh, that's how cells and, and basically all the animals and plants are actually evolved from. And uh, one algorithm only 
based on sponges, this is the amount of things that you can have. They don't, all, they don't look the same, they don't act the same. Uh, so we wanted to go through these type of elements. So we did exactly that. We picked on one cell, because it's a unicellular element, and then there's the split, and there's cell, uh, cellular differentiation. And with one cell, different setups, and you get totally different outcomes. Obviously, the cells are always the same, and, uh, and you can, you can call this decoding. So we decoded basically a lot of, of the morphogenesis kind of behaviors, and we coded them into their functionality, and that's what gave us this kind of um, elements. So well, the way it uh, interacts is uh, you have a core cell, and, um, and we just increase the number of core elements or um, the way they will react uh, to different conditions, and once they start to interact with each other, and uh, the... the the coagulation happens, you know. Like so there's, there's this element the called the cell signal, signaling distance. That's one of the parts of the chemical reactions that's very important. Some chemical reactions actually propel other cells or go further than others, and that's what allows this kind of elements. We, we picked on the signaling further ahead in our works because it could actually be appropriated. And again, another um, video uh, trying to... to depict what we did. So basically, that form, those forms actually are these ones. And what you see, this is not one cell. These are the, the, the changing of the colors, the gradient is like cells being born and dying, as they do. And if they connect, they start to, to generate a body. So you see, they start the signaling, so they're the arms. And um, they start to creating this kind of element, that physical element that starts to be propelled in space. You see that one will eventually fade away because it's not connected to anyone. So through all this, again, in Maya, in, we have, because it's traced and it's traced, we have more than 5,000 kind of little elements like this, and this is only takes kind of 30 seconds. And uh, obviously it's a controlled morphogenic environment. And the outcome is this. Uh, it's totally unexpected, you wouldn't model, I mean, you can model, but I don't know the logic that would infer, but it's accurate, it's parametric, and, and that's, and this is a 3D print of that, so you can actually fabricate these things nowadays, and uh, try to promote other systems. So, this is the part of algorithmic that we are interested in, so it incorporates the parameters, but in a behavioral sense, not in a fabrication one. Uh, however, the fabrication is, is, is a critical component. Uh, the last, I think, step would be on interaction. That's where things really spin off a bit. Uh, but it's about the system itself. So whatever you saw before, it was always constrained to an environment and modeled within an environment. And you generally tend to do that way. What if we can put these things and interact them with the external world. So that algorithm would actually behave differently. And that's what it comes off. The designer becomes part outside. So you actually put it on the environment. You are at the same level of the environment. Not You are not parting the system. You're not designing the system. The system has its own feedback. However, its own feedback responds to the input and output, which is something that gets you totally out of control. What you can do is control the code, nothing else. And even the code acts, reacts differently to other kind of uh, situations. And so you also learn from that uh, experience itself. So it's not like a linear process where um, you do something and you know the result of it in such a way. Sometimes you cannot foresee what's ha going to happen. Um, yes. In this case, uh, this was an exhibition um, was part of an exhibition uh, element that we designed. Um, so we are seeing the physical uh, model of the environment uh, called Emosphere, uh, where each uh, node is a creation of uh, that script that we have talked about. Um, and the way they interact with each other, they tend to generate uh, new formations, cellular formations. And um, 
the built model has its own um, type of um, sensors embedded onto it so that when you get closer to it, you, you are also informing the system, and, and which that, is connected to a virtual world that yeah. so propagates th other what, stuff. What's important is on this motion where, where we took out from the diffusion and limited degradation from the morphogenesis, what if this is not nanoparticles? What if these are people? Because you, you stroll around in space, obviously there's intention into it, but still you are always attracted to something that's or you are cognitive or perceivably responding to the stimulus of the space, and therefore you, you move accordingly. So, yes, it's different moving patterns. However, the principle is fairly similar. So the way you engage with the system is through a um, um, gamepad, and, but as well as it has some uh, infrared sensors and uh, some microphones, so it also detects your bodily existence along um, with the model. Um, and through those um, sensors, it um, starts to trigger uh, events happening within that virtual environment and also along the with the... The intention for, for this multitude of sensors is as, as well as the cell signaling processes, there are different chemical reactions that actually extend more and more or less and less. So the IR sensor is fairly one meter close and you react to that one. The microphone gets the sense of the sound in the space, and, and there's obviously the gameplay for interaction. And uh, the actuators, we will go through that. So those, all those things are connected, and they react, and there'll be the actuators reacting to that. So on that specific piece that you just saw in the previous photo, there are some antennas that will go through those things. So the actuators are basically memory alloys, which actually basically act on the same element as tropism, so there's a, a, uh, once you put some heat on it, they deform and they create other shapes. And so these antennas, in a way, attract the, the person or makes you move around and try to interact with, 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 the, with, the, with the piece. Also the interaction, that serves for serving for a physical interaction, so people get attracted, you get closer, so then there's the IR sensor, gets you another level of interaction. So you start understanding things are becoming more responsive to you, not so much to, towards the environment. And that will have an inference on what the projection is going to be and how we can interact with that virtual world in a way, as well as the sound. The sound also plays a big role. And that's why maybe why, why we use sound in a transacoustical manner, because it might, if it's too calm, you want to make the environment lively make a big noise and the whole algorithm is running and actually running through the environment and analyzing if it's, there's less level of sound or a high level of sound and it reacts to that as well. So it's not open only towards the algorithm itself but towards the environment. And this is how the, the memory alloys work. So basically you, you just have the interactions and with Arduinos or Fireflies and, and the and in our case, we didn't even use those. We use Max MSP. And once you put some power into it, it, get, it creates tension. And that makes everything move, basically. And once you turn it off, it has a cooled off period, just like the Mimosa. So, so this is basically how, we, how the whole thing worked. So, so there's yeah, the users um, interact with the system through the gamepad, so they can move around the virtual space, uh, and also um, the infrared sensors detect uh, the person's existence um, along with the model. The microphones record the sounds, and all these things feed into the algorithm, which um, has uh, various outcomes. Um, some are more kinetic, so the actuators start to move, the model responds to you in such a way, and the visual elements, the, the virtual environment will start to have uh, different events happening. So um, you move around that virtual environment, try to see um, the different parts of that world. Uh, and um, the sound uh, as well, it, it has this kind of an algorithm that it would respond to, to the uh, environment uh, in a different way. Uh, that we use granular sounds and additive synthesis uh, to achieve that outcome. So this is in 2007, and there was no Oculus at that time, but uh, yeah. uh, we, there was a big projection, and basically you were allowed to move as you move freely in VR games now. 
And basically, you see here this little wire and the antennas. That's what makes the whole thing kind of move. Um, and uh, so you actually can actually react because other people tend to either react more to physical elements than to the virtual, at least at that time. I don't, probably now it will be inverse, but uh, then once you start to interact with this, this thing will have a, also change, and the sound as well. So you can actually control with the gamepad. There was no iPad at the time. And, uh, and or you can have your own sonic experience and start playing with the soundscape in a way instead of interacting with anything else. And this would be a bit of, uh, if, if you had that gamepad on the hand, there will be different elements. And basically, once you're traveling through the virtual world, all these, uh, some of these, some, this one is stable, but many of the other elements are also dynamic and react to things that you are behaving like sound. And, uh, and uh, there will be, once you are in the virtual environment, if you are displacing yourself, not physically, but in the virtual environment, the virtual world and the antennas will also react on, onto those, onto those uh, displacement on the virtual, not on the physical. So there's a lot of information going on, and it's more like a transactive situation than an interactive one. So you don't really know what the other side is going to give you, uh, because on interactive environments, now you start to play with them, and you know the behaviors, and you start controlling them. In this case, the, the whole world will shift his, his, uh, his um, behavior according to, well, in this case, it's just reacting to, to the environment itself. The previous one, the virtual environment itself, the previous one was about sound and changing the colors, and uh, people would move freely, and this. Also, there's these cells coming on, voids, which are now very uh, kind of, there's a lot of architectural projects made on those, but those things actually are cellular kind of behaviors, and, and they, they try to move in flocks, and they depict that, so people try to follow them, they would run away, and there was all these kind of elements that could be experienced in the virtual world that could not be in the real world. So the last project uh, we will talk about is uh, the 1 plus 1 equals 3, Systems of Didactic Communication, which was part of an exhibition uh, that uh, ran in MoMA uh, in Istanbul, uh, Modern Art uh, Gallery. Uh, and I believe um, one of your future uh, lecturers, Alexis Chanel um, and Murat Chanel, they will be also um, giving a lecture. Um, and they were also part of the um, exhibition, so you'll be uh, seeing some of their works as well. Um, in our case, we, uh, we had a kind of a pop-up space which would be utilized from time to time. So uh, we, we think of uh, creating this virtual environment where people could uh, come in and engage with uh, and experience the space. Um, and through that engagement, they will uh, learn um, new information or new ways of engaging with space, uh, which is not, a, not an everyday experience. So you would have to use a kind of a, a tool, which was a, a smartphone in, in this case, and you would move through space with that smartphone and you would be experiencing these uh, virtual happenings, events uh, through that experience. So, um, Basically what you would have, you downloaded uh, our geometry, so there was a movie playing, a physical movie, so it was there, it was, you could sit in front of it about the geometry moving around, and, but on top of that, there would be an app that you could download from Dropbox, it would be an augmented reality. When you put your iPhone or iPad facing that, you would have an overlapping of the, of the, of the geometry, so you could actually move around and get in part of the movie, so app kind of seem, habit the movie as well, inhabit the movie, and would allow it to play with those things, as well as sound again. And this is, these are our trials, so we were trying to play with the computer. There's obviously the, the QR code, that's, that's the whole thing that triggers everything. There's also the geolocated, but since we were in a building, we could not be geolocated, so we, we opted for the safer version, and, and the, the QR code gives you different glimpse of what kind of geometry and how can you interact with geometry. So basically you can see this is the photos from the iPhone and over a computer, not even the movie itself. So basically what we did here was we eradicated 
the whole part on, on the physicality, and we end basically virtual with the sound, and that's where sound becomes very pervasive in a way, because it can be virtual, but it's very, very natural and actual for everybody, and it's always present. Uh, but the, the, the structure is very similar. You know, there's an interaction between the sound, the visual, and the algorithm, and the user itself. And, and in this moment, we don't have, obviously, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have movies, and uh, we didn't capture it, but uh, so once you get into the space, you get that big, and this would be the, the, the movie, and then you would, once you go through and, or move yourself, and there's different QRs coming up, you can experience the, the, the form and the geometry and, and try to understand what, what could be expected from that space, not on a projecting manner, but actually on a semi-actual manner, because it's augmented reality, basically, what we're doing. So now that, I mean, basically, we, we try to go through these things. However, what we really go through, it's this. Uh, and this is how we operate. Uh, and, and these are the actual definitions of, of those. And uh, so we work on a poesis on a more, let's say, parametric mode, uh, on autopoiesis, on, on, a more, on a system that's actually reacting and maintaining itself, but in a constrained environment. And then the allopoiesis, where a system creates something other than itself. So it's always open for external communication. So that we also learn from that experience new behaviors. And uh, so in, in models, so if you models you use all of these, and uh, many, we generally, everybody starts using until here, since we are architects, or probably the majority is. So until 3D plus time, we can get architecture, because you need to experience space. The only additional element with the four dimensional is all the complex geometries, and now all the technology on the virtual and the augmented worlds that can give you higher dimensions and there can give you other outputs because there's a jump from models to those dimensions and then operating through different types of modalities. So modes of experience space in a different way is very dependent on what you experience. And so what for us trans architecture might mean might come off like this spatial expression of creativity across and beyond human taxonomies. So basically, it's designing beyond disciplines. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Fred and Mugo, for an incredibly, for me anyway, challenging and rich lecture. You've explained at least I now know what um, transacoustics is, so that's fantastic. I'd like to invite Chris Knapp up to the stage. Chris is an assistant professor at the Abidian School of Architecture at Bond University, and he's also been a director of Studio Workshop, a Gold Coast design practice since 2015. So like Fred and Muge, he has an interest in parametricism as well as practice. So we thought he'd be an excellent person to open the discussion tonight. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and thank you very much um, for that presentation. That was really fascinating and um, yeah thanks to all the all the people in attendance tonight um, I've written down a lot of questions so I've got to just take a minute to collect my thoughts and, and think about where to start um, I think my well my line of, of inquiry to just try to unpack what we just experienced a bit um, might be geared a bit towards the the fact that we have quite a lot of students um, in the audience tonight and maybe to ask kind of a, a very dumb question, um, just to get things going, is um, should all of the, uh, I guess the, the kind of keen bean architects, future architects in the audience, um, all be rushing out and making sure that they learn to code? Do you see coding as an essential skill for the discipline moving forward? Or, or if, if one chooses not to, um, maybe what's the, what are the ramifications of that? Well, um... And obviously you have a bias, uh, given you know, the, the way that you're approaching things, so that you know, maybe there's an obvious answer to that question, but 
you know, you hear, you hear the idea of, you know, people learning to code is like, you know, we need to start teaching kindergartners and first graders to, mm -hmm. to learn to code or to learn how to use Arduino, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm interested in that kind of more yeah. broader implication. It's a new kind of um, like communicating with, uh, with the tools that we have. So I see it more like a language that um, if you want to communicate with, with that type of an environment, then you should definitely uh, learn. Um, mm. And nowadays, as we are architects or designers, we tend to think more visually. So the visual uh, coding or visual programming is much easier for much easier than many of uh, people would think of. So I think if you want to learn a new language and uh, communicate through that language, then you should definitely learn it. Um, I don't really believe that we should be ignoring it in such a way that what happened to the um, in the initial ideas of when digital uh, tools uh, became apparent and i don't i don't think that uh, we should be you know taken by it fully so that uh, we forget uh, who we are or whom we are designing for um, so it's just a tool that if if you want to experiment with it then you should learn it it's a personal choice that's how i see it yeah, at, at the end, I, I, the code, I think, it's just another language, literally, yep. just an artificial one. So it's basically how to learn English or French. Or, uh, however, the computer is far less forgiving than anybody else. Mm. For non-English speaking people, you still can maybe understand me. But a computer, if you make a syntax error, then there appears syntax error. And then that's a big blockage. So that's, that's a big difference. But Again, yes, it's all about creativity, and if your creativity is pushing you or driving you through coding, you should go through it. Yeah. Because it's opening up a new new uh, way of seeing the world as well, like any other language. Um, so if you want to experiment those worldviews, um, today it's coding. Um, a couple of years ago, it was like nerve surfaces and blobism, and you know. So it's it's always changing uh, in a way. Mm. I think that's one of the challenges of um, like uh, you always need to develop yourself in such a way that you should be open to new things. And God knows how we'll communicate in the future as architects with with our design tools. And you know, it's always changing. Yeah. So I guess a further question then, um, you, you raised the issue of, of failure, you, you touched on that a bit, you know, things, um, I guess with the, maybe it was the Manta project, you know, talking about things that would mm -hmm. be sort of unpredictable or, um, you know, certain con conditions in that system would, would fail. And um, things like coding, and as you just said, you know, things like syntax errors, and you know, there's a real precision and discipline to um, using, using coding or visual um, algorithm languages. Um, so how does one, I guess, build in the space for failure? You know, how, how, does, how does one, um, I mean, this is kind of a tricky question that you know, probably all architects, you know, wrestle with in various forms or another, but um, through, through your kind of lens, um, do you have a, a kind of a, a philosophy or, a, um, or an intuition or a procedure that kind of inbuilds um, chance? I mean, this is, I think, one of the issues of, you know, there's a, a kind of a debate around where does authorship reside, and if you're so kind of controlling, um, on one hand, with um, you know how something needs to be you know authored or contrived, versus just letting the um, letting the algorithm do its thing, and then you know what you know what you get is what you get, and at a certain point, you know you're you're relinquishing control to the um, uh, the script, if you will. So how, so how do you think about failure or or even sort of unexpected uh, outcomes? Um, in the work. It's I'm great. sure Fred wants to address <laughs> this question. Uh, so the, the thing about uh, coding is that you, you, it's an iteration, so you start evolving it, right? Mm. It, it just doesn't pop up as a brilliant idea, and you keep on working on it. So we'll have iterations that things are, that are going to work eventually, uh, but since you are always pushing it, similar to an architectural project, there's, the deadline is there, but you are always designing until two days before. Mm. You're always changing mm. something. Yeah. So it's, coding is very much the same. Uh, you have iteration that works. It's not the one that you wanted, but it does, it does some sort of the job. Yep. And uh, in that way, you can deal with failure because you know that you have something safe.
because you went through so many roads and, and one element is going to be working. Uh, might not do everything that you stand for, mm. but still since everything is so new and, and not obviously because it's, it's far detached from practice, that's an, that's an import, important point, but those are the ones that do not allow failure because there's a mm. lot of dollars involved. Right. But since you are in academia, um, I think we should push towards successful failures. So that's actually experimentation. Mm. That's, that's the base of experiment. If, if you are not having failures, then you are not experimenting. You are just acquiring know-how. So that's, that's my view. Yeah. Yeah. And in, say, um, given your experience working for Zaha Hadid, you know, known as a very um, you know, experimental um, sort of avant-garde practice, um, I guess can you maybe relate or convey how something like failure or sort of you know, risk-taking um, unfolds in, in a space like that? You might get a vase on your head. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, there were times of failure there as well. Mm. Um, but, but the stakes are higher, I guess, but, as you yeah. say. Uh, and also, um, it was also mostly on experimentation, um, too. So there would be times uh, which uh, some ideas would be tested, and, um, and they would be tested throughout different types of competitions and different um, I mean, of typology or form making or, or um, yeah, um, so you would see a variation of a similar kind of an approach and sometimes they would succeed and sometimes they would not. So, and that was the part when failure would take in. So not, they don't really get to build everything they, they propose. Sure. Yeah, so and at that the time when we were there, uh, the office was kind of shrinking in such a way that we were like 40 people left, mm. and now it's 600, so yeah. surely they learned from their failures. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. Yeah. Um, just a, maybe a different line of questioning. Um, the, the morphogenetic projects, which so that you know, discussing um, kind of nanoparticles and some of these kind of you know, behavioral analyses and things like that, sort of local interactions of things, um, and then talking about, um, I guess, designing uh, set, a set of discrete parameters for a, for a system and you know, a system of particles that relate to each other, et cetera. And then that, um, what we saw in the work uh, was depicted as either uh, kind of a, a virtual projection or, um, you know, kind of a, a model which maybe is presumably something that represents a building, um, but, you know, depending on how you classify what a building is mm -hmm. or sort of conventional idea of architecture is, mm -hmm. uh, maybe harder to classify. And I guess this is just a, a question that's about clarifying how you think of the work as either um, uh, being literally, uh, like, are, when you're working at that cellular level, do you think of it as we're working on something which is one-to-one? -one? We're at the scale of something cellular? Or do you think of it as um, this is analogous to, say, a city? You know, you mentioned how these bodies could be exchanged for, or these particles could be exchanged for bodies in space, um, in physical space. Um, so I guess I'm interested how you might, you know, conceive of that. You know, when you're, when you're working on your, uh, say, a research question, uh, around the tools that you're um, you're investigating, um, do you sometimes see them as analogs for different scales of things, or or do you you tend to think of them as more discrete and and localized? Um, I'm really glad actually you asked this question mm. because I'm sure everybody has this doubt in their mind: is this really architecture, or or is it really like? Um, a, can it be a built environment, or you know, if we look at it through that perspective? Like, where are um, the toilets? Yeah, where are the toilets? What everyone's yeah. thinking. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> but I think um, from, from what we, we think is, uh, I'm talking for both of us, it's part of the experimentation that we, we throughout these uh, complex um, studies, we, we tend, we learn a lot, and uh, we see the most of the tools or most, most of the the things that we find out becomes uh, as part of the field. Like if we were to talk about the first initial project that we show, where we um, kind of overlay the laser cut pieces, um, 
nobody was really understanding it at the time, but they become some part of the reality. Mm. Um, so uh, we see them mostly as um, as our playground where we experiment and we learn the tools and techniques, and then we implement those to uh, build the environment. And we can do it much easier because they are um, much clearer in such a way that we can engage it uh, much easier. That's how I see it. Yeah, it's uh, our playground. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a, it's a one to one. Uh, mm. You you see the particle as a particle. Yep. And again, the same thing that departs from Kisler's work. Mm. Uh, where the elemental is elemental and it's not analog or metaphorical at any point. Uh, we, have, we are lucky enough to have the tools to experiment with those, while Kissel didn't, but it did some challenging propositions which actually are occurring now and virtually 100 years later mm. or 80. Mm. And, uh, and he actually mentioned the chemical cell, the biological cell, and through how can you interact through those elements, not as a mode of, uh, of uh, spatial interaction, but as a behavior encoded kind of principle that would act afterwards get uh, reciprocated into a space. Um, so that's basically what we are doing. It's not really groundbreaking. But uh, the interesting thing is once now the nanotechs are coming and we are being able already to code material, hmm. how are you going to code that wall? That's going to be critical and, you know, that will come. Maybe, I don't know, that wall, I mean, there's already walls that are being coded, maybe in more mechanical, but the nanotech is also going to offer you that versatility on, on, the, on the materiality, and then it will become current practice. So yeah. it's, it's kind of, we are, you know, on our path, but eventually you all get engulfed in, in and become practice-oriented in a way, hmm. so hmm. it's just an ideal situation. Yeah, so in terms of, uh, I guess, the outcomes or maybe where this this is headed, um, picking up on the notion of the trans or the, um, I guess, the transvergence, um, the, the trans architecture, you know, in, in your, I guess, your worldview or the um, uh, the set of procedures or approaches that you've, you've set up, you know, I, I see you guys as thinking of the architect as the kind of the medium where different worlds can kind of meet and you're using your tools to kind of translate the way that those things come together. So with respect to, um, let's say, the ability to code material, that then suggests the idea of, say, transmateriality, perhaps. Um, what, what areas of convergence or, let's say, transformation do you think are maybe the most exciting or the ones that you're wanting to push your work towards, or as a maybe a, a parallel question, uh, what uh, peer practices or other practices, say internationally, do you guys look at um, and see you know, operating in that space and starting to take it to some fruitful places? Like Scholar Tibbets or you know, yeah. others so, mentioned yes, those, before. Yeah, so there's Tibbets, there's Mark Screws at, he's in London and uh, you know, and there's Oxman, but at some point, to some mm. extent, their work, especially their her latest article on, on Entangled. Um, not, not all the works she proposed, but some of them that actually are interacting with the molecular level. And um, there's many of the more art-oriented projects we look at uh, than architecture, mm. obviously, because uh, even within biannals and things Things are very, very constrict on, on this kind of level, but you can see the MIT works and Tibbetts is coming out. There's going to be a lecture on, uh, what's the name? Mater coding mat material or material materialism kind yeah. of a thing in the next months coming off. Right. So uh, it's, it's all about, it's going to start propelling and if it's on MIT, it's going to obviously to propel somewhere else. Hmm. Practice wise, did decoy maybe? <laughs> yeah, so there was there was people that we started Mark Goulthorpe and yep. again, and, but back in the day uh, when they were you know trying all these interaction elements and and with that big wall at MIT and all the kind of triangulation the way all the kind of things happened, but it was dynamic. So all those things was was, was a good was a good yeah cars as well yeah. mm. hyperbodies, yep. um, but they are not nanotech. 
they, but they, they react and interact and even transact. Yeah. But uh, so things, since the technology is changing, um, I, at the moment I'm, I'm not aware of any practice that actually uh, is using besides academia. Mm. Yeah. So well, there are the, um, like, Gary has that research group they just yes. um, implemented within their uh, office. I think they, that was a big leap for their office because it's a more uh, like um, they are building in many, many places all over the world. So they are open for a certain level of experimentation. So mm. um, with the Gary Technologies, um, yeah. Zaha so did something similar with the Zaha Corporation. With, there's yeah. a part of research group I integrated yep. with. But so things are changing. Like there is more experimentation. And especially if you are um, designing your own tools, then you really stick out within the, this world of open source coding. Um, it's not just about uh, hacking some codes and bringing in them together into an amalgamation, and, and, uh, but it's more about uh, exploring new grounds and uh, doing more research in mm. a way. Mm. And um, yeah, so things will propagate more uh, to that kind of an understanding of, of design. Uh, it's all about in a way, tool making. Um, yeah. Exciting times. We've got Kelly doing the hovers. Yeah. Should, we, should oh, we end on okay. that note? <laughs> oh, we were really happy here. <laughs> <laughs> Chatting. Really happy, but I'm going to have to say thank you very much to Chris, Fred, and yeah, Muge for um, the discussion <laughs> and for the lecture tonight. Thank you. Yeah. The reason. The reason we have to finish is we're nearly out of time, but before we finish tonight, we need to announce the ARC I Spy winner for this evening. And this week's winner is Cloud Dwellers, known to us in, around the School of Architecture as Jason Haig. So if Jason's here, we've actually got his pack down the front, but I can't see him in the audience, so we will arrange to get that to him soon. Uh, a gorgeous drawing, uh, um, a gorgeous photo of some brickwork, which we know he's completely obsessed with, so a totally appropriate photo for him to win with. Um, and my final duty of the evening is to remind you that we've got a two-week break now for Easter and Anzac Day, and we'll see you back here on the 2nd of May for the second half of the series for more lectures. We're starting off with an exciting double header from Atelia Chen Hung. Um, the director, Melody, Hung, uh, Melody Chen, is joining us, uh, along with another young practice, Maytree Studios. The founder, Rebecca Caldwell, and Emily Jukes, an associate, are going to be joining us, three women architects, with young practices from Brisbane on stage talking to us about um, how they're running their innovative practices. So I think that should be another fantastic lecture. But thanks again to Muge, Fred and Chris for tonight. Thank you.